Uh, welcome to the Convest Report, where we sit down with industry experts to discuss the latest developments in the Canadian small cap sector. I'm your host, Arlen Hansen. Standard disclaimer, no part of this interview shall be construed as investment advice. And as we don't know what stocks we're talking about today, Kin may own shares in the companies or be compensated about the companies we discuss in today's interview. If you find these interviews of value, be sure to join our network, subscribe to our channel, comment on the videos below, and share them with like-minded investors. Today, I'm joined by Fabi Lara, founder of The Next Big Rush, social media channel and daily newsletter with some of the highest engagement rates in the junior mining industry. She writes a wildly entertaining letter, smart as a whip, and has a great pulse on the small cap market. And guess what? She loves uranium. So I thought I'd bring her on and pick her brain. Fabi, thanks so much for being here. How are you today? Thank you. I'm doing great, especially with um, the slight uptick in uranium <laughs> lately. So like today, I feel good. Tomorrow, I can yeah. guarantee. <laughs> Feels good for the psyche, eh? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so tell me, it's been a very long wait. We talked about like the improved mood today. Um, but what are you excited about right now in the space particularly? So what I see in the market right now is that you have chemical moving. And chemical has been moving in strength for the last, you know, I guess year to date, chemicals yep. doing really well. You know, it's not just the last couple of months. If you, if you look at any chart, uh, you'll see that it's been moving in strength. And now there is a whole discussion regarding chemical. Is it an actual uranium miner? You know, they're, they're yeah. into the downstream part of the uranium of the nuclear fuel cycle now heavily, uh, and they have actually structured some of their contracts in a way whereby, you know, whenever the massive bull market that we're all expecting happens, they may not capture everything. And there's criticism, you know, uh, around that, but it's still the only, you know, big time producer in North America that produces in any size. And it's generally safe. They have really great assets. And mm. it's the kind of company that fits the bill for institutions. So what you see is that generalist institutions and, you know, mining focused institutions are buying chemical and that's why you see it move. Mm. Mm. And I think that's a great bellwether, you know, as to, you know, where we're going next with a whole nuclear cycle. Fingers mm. crossed well, this time. The, is yes. well, well, stocks often move before the metals, right? Because they're forward looking. And and chemical gives yeah. leverage to uranium price. And so it, I think it demonstrates that generalist money flow is going into the sector, right? Yeah. And then it will start coming downstream into our markets more. And one thing that happened in uranium itself as a commodity is it did not go down with the other commodities. It's held and it actually has gone up this year. We're up just under 20%, I believe. Which is a and big move. It, it, yeah, it absolutely is. I, I mean, people tell me all the time, oh, you know, the story with uranium, it's never going to pan out because I've been hearing it for 10 years. And I tell them, look, it used to be $18 a pound and it, we're close to 60 now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's been moving up and I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. So the fact that the chemical is moving, I think it, I mean, don't get me wrong, the fundamental thesis, the actual supply and demand dynamics have been amazing yeah. for you know, the last couple of years, and they've been better than I've ever imagined for them to be at this point. I did not imagine all the extensions, Japan coming back, new mines, you know, being announced by many different countries, Asia going, mm -hmm. you know, very hard into nuclear, et cetera. We're going to talk about that in a bit. But that was happening in the background, long-term contracts being signed in the background. Now we see chemical moving, unfortunately, Niger, which is something that we're going to touch upon later on happening, I think has also kind of jolted the market a little bit to say like, well, oh, for sure. Supply, supply is, is at risk. <laughs> fragile. Absolutely. Yeah. Those things coming together. I think it's finally making, you know, people move. Yeah. Okay. So from a devil's advocate, we've gone from 18 to 60. Yeah. So some people may go, oh, am I buying at the high? Right. So where do you think, what stage of the bull market do you think we're in, in for the uranium? So I, I think that at the end of 2021, if I'm not mistaken, we reached a peak and we've been uh, sideways, sideways to down ever since. Yep. Um, I believe that this year I, I could 
probably guess springtime was the turnaround moment where, you know, stocks in general have stopped going down, which, you know, was, it meant something at the time because people were, small retail was throwing in the towel. Oh, and you remember she, that day on Twitter, don't you? <laughs> I remember many days on Twitter, but yeah, I do, I do remember, I do remember, you know, um, particularly in the uranium sector, people are very passionate. Very. And so you can tell retail sentiment very easy. And I take advantage of that. I look at sentiment and when I see that some people who actually call them themselves uranium investors, you know, like their name is uranium investor, some odd number saying, you know, I'm selling everything. I'm out of this. You know, this I'm is this, yeah. never going to happen. I'm like, oh, okay, shoot. I got to buy more. <laughs> you yeah. know, this is, this is a signal. Obviously, if everything else lines up and it did at the time, so we we've been moving up ever since i think this is well i don't think anybody would tell you this is a new uranium bull market i think this is the continuation of that bull market from 18 dollars um to 60 back down to i think the 40s and back to 60 and uh yeah i think we're we're nowhere close to reaching the end and the reason why i say this is I am very focused on buying everything cheap. And I do get very, you know, cautious when I see a commodity that has moved up, you know, quite a bit like uranium has. But, but the reason why I think this is going to have legs is investing in uranium or in the nuclear fuel cycle, let's call it, is kind of looking into the future, right? Because demand for uranium is future demand. Yeah. You're never talking about something that is going to be needed today. None of these pounds that are being contracted right now are going to go into any plants today or tomorrow or even next year. This is stuff that is going to be necessary, you know, in the next three to seven to 10 years. And so if you can look and see that demand is growing, for future nuclear power plants. You have to add that to your model. And then you're going to realize that, you know, the gap between what we can supply and what demand has to be, because there's no alternative to uranium in the nuclear fuel cycle. And by the way, there is an alternative to copper. We don't really need to put gold in industrials. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is a, an alternative to silver in most cases. For uranium specifically, like you cannot possibly use anything else. Yeah. And so this is why I believe that the high that we reached, I think in 20, was it 2011? No, it was uh, 2007 was the, the latest high. It was 140 uh, US dollars per pound. I that remember that be, very well. <laughs> that would be around 200 bucks nowadays. Yeah. I don't see any reason why we don't reach it and maybe uh, even surpass it. At the time, there were not nearly as many nuclear power plants being announced. There was no such thing as a push for, you know, SMRs, small modular yep. reactors. And there, there wasn't this coming back to uranium, which is happening right now. So it's one thing for you to take a look at, you know, China is planning on building 150 nuclear power plants. Great. That takes five to 10 years each, et cetera. And you can model that out. But when Japan says, okay, we are going back to nuclear because guess what? We don't have an option. <laughs> yeah. Then they need to start looking at their inventory right now. Right. right. The plan is for right now. And so they need to come to the market sooner um, and you know, the, the market is quite thin. There are not many producers and you look at the producers, they're struggling. You know, mm -hmm. this is, this is not where you come to set up a business and make a lot of money. You know, <laughs> uranium is not it. And because of that, you have a handful of producers, you know, uh, the cheapest guys are in a jurisdiction you probably don't want to mess with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every now and again, we have a few surprises uh, regarding, can't get any stock. So this is, this is why I think we have a long way to go yet. Yeah. Commodity wise, the stocks can act in a different manner. Well, they could go up 20% tomorrow. You just don't know. They could. Yeah. Like, or down. Or down. Yeah. <laughs> well, lately it's been down 20% every day, right? <laughs> um, so all the analysts are calling for higher you. Uh, you're calling for higher uranium prices. 
I am. It's just my opinion. Who cares? Um, but what do you think the biggest risks uh, towards our bull market thesis is? Like, where, what's what's the bear argument? I think the bear argument is that, and I kid you not, there are um, many, many millions, maybe billions of pounds hidden somewhere uh, that some countries are stockpiling, and they will, you know, flood the market if need be. I don't believe in that because I don't consider it mobile inventory. It's one right. thing for a country to hold uranium. The U.S. just bought, you know, I think a million pounds worth of uranium from their local producers. They're not going to sell it. They they're just going to hold it because they're stockpiling. It's a nas- it? Yeah, it's it's a national really? security issue. Yeah, absolutely. And that that's common. You know, they do that, and they, they they'll never sell. There's no financial incentive because they didn't buy it from for a financial incentive. And in doing so, you have to look at all the existing uranium and kind of exclude, you know, ones that belong to governments and countries that want that for their own strategic uh, purposes. And so that's out of the market. I guess one thing that could derail, maybe not fully derail, but um, postpone a, a bull market in uranium would be if there were another catastrophe such as Fukushima. Yeah. yeah. Now, the the thing is, yes, the stocks would absolutely crater. And I don't think that, you know, the average person would make much money from that event in any case. I still have my doubts whether the commodity price would go down as much as we think it would, because at the end of the day, it comes back to the fact that demand is there. And we and need that, that. <laughs> there there is no much. Yeah, that mm-hmm. the inventory. Uh, that we had, you know, back 10 years ago, uh, isn't there anymore. And the power plants absolutely need it. They don't have an alternative, an alternative like I said previously. No. And so maybe you, you'd you see a reaction in the spot market. Uh, and I think it it picked right up because you can't just all of a sudden turn off um, all these nuclear power plants. It would make no sense whatsoever and people would suffer because energy prices would completely skyrocket in some jurisdictions. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Um, so does does the EU stockpile uranium the same as the U.S. government does? I don't think so. That's a good okay. question. But I think what happens in the EU, uh, it's more for usage. So the the EU in and of itself is a strange uh, jurisdiction. Because they make the laws, but each individual country will have their own, you know, matrix, energy matrix. And so they'll go out and purchase the pounds that they need from whatever countries they see fit. And it just so happens that, you know, the the EU doesn't um, always move in unison. For some things they do and for some things Mm -hmm. they don't. And so it's kind of all over the place. Uh, For example... When it came to the Russian Ukrainian crisis, uh, and they were talking about possibly banning certain products coming out of Russia, including uranium and nuclear fuel, some countries voted completely against it because they didn't have anywhere else to go. And so, mm-hmm. in that case, as you know, a body, they decided not to ban it officially. However, what happened was that naturally the different countries and different utilities thought, you know, at the end of the day, our job is to keep our jobs. Mm-hmm. And in order to keep our jobs, we need to secure supply more than make sure we're getting the best deal, the best price, et cetera. So secure supply has been a focus. And with that, they have naturally been moving away from trying to make their supplies, you know, come from Russia and other risky jurisdictions. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, what countries in the UA, in the EU, sorry, um, are really moving towards pro-nuclear and are there any countries going backwards? So pretty much as far as I know, only Germany has gone backwards. And, Why? You know, Why? Off their plans. <laughs> they have their own idea of what is their future and the type of energy, the type of grid they want to have. So they they really love all the green stuff, 
I think their aversion to risk is such that they don't want to touch nuclear. Mm-hmm. And it unfortunately has made, you know, uh, electricity extremely expensive in Germany for some time. And it makes them have to sign agreements with uh, Russia and others that maybe they wouldn't like to, but they're forced to. And it has also made them, funny enough, uh, expand their coal usage. Interesting. So, like dirtier, dirtier know, energy. Yes, let's do that. It sounds like a great idea. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And idiots. <laughs> the, the thing with some countries is that once they have an idea in their head of what they believe to be good versus bad, and they sell that idea to the public. Yeah, they can't go they back must, on it. They must push it forward because, you know, the, the people in power there, you know, from voters voting them in. And so you have you have to keep it going. So, uh, but everybody else that I can think of has been pro nuclear and has made a shift towards expanding uh, lately. Even Belgium, I mean, Belgium, I was counting them out completely, and they've just agreed to extensions. Uh, you look at Poland; they're bringing in, you know, new capacity. You look at Sweden, and it's pretty much any other country in the EU is saying, "Yep, we need more nuclear." France. Well, that that has was the big news. Powerhouse. Yeah. yeah, that was the news out of this week, right? Sweden saying that just came out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So speaking about like the mining of uranium, what countries got economic deposits? What what countries are actually producing? Um, where, where do you see really good geological potential for uranium deposits in the EU? Okay, so where do I see good economic potential for uranium? Nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> that well. is part of the thesis. Let me tell you this. That. That's part of the thesis because it is so expensive to get uranium out of the ground unless you have no regard for pollution and, you know, community ties and things like that, that it makes it so that most modern or Western jurisdictions uh, make it very difficult and very, very expensive to extract it. So you have a situation whereby you, you could pick most countries Okay, uh, let's say Kazakhstan. Great jurisdiction because it's cheap. It's cheap because their environmental laws are very weak. It's a partly yeah. government-owned company that extracts it. Uh, their, you know, their assets are good and they're able to mine it for cheap. But shipping has been a massive issue. They change management every like three to six months. Oh, wow. And so they, they've been struggling, you know, with, with uh, ramping up production. They've been saying, we're going to ramp up, we're going to ramp up. And uh, then next year, they're like, actually, we, we could only do this much. Mm-hmm. And so you look at, you know, Niger, fifth, sixth uh, largest exporter. 5% of the world's production. Exactly. Political coup happened and that's kind of gone out the window. Nobody knows yet where that's headed. Um, You have the USA, tons and tons and tons of uh, actual pounds in the ground. The land of red tape. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Not not so much the land of the free and the brave. It's like the Mm. land of red tape. Just, you know, government body after government body, it's, you know, all the four letter words coming down and very, very difficult to get anything off the ground. Um, You look at the Athabasca Basin up in Canada, great grade, but really expensive to set it up. CapEx is just absolutely insane. Whatever we've seen, you know, the next gens and fissions of this world. Um, I think their capex at the time, you know, was around maybe a billion, a billion and a half. That was before, uh, you know, Game. inflation really inflation. hit. Yep. Yeah. It was before it was very expensive to borrow money. And now I can only imagine what uh, these would cost. Plus, it's not easy for you to get people to work, uh, you know, on your uranium mine. You know, in nobody... northern Saskatchewan and minus exactly. 40 degrees. Yeah, I've yeah. been up there and it, it's it's, it's a it's a tough country. It's beautiful. I call Absolutely. it God's I call it God's country. It's just stunning up there. But yeah, yeah. very tough, tough working in, environment. I, I think sure. it's God's country because there's only God there. There's nothing else. God and snow. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's beautiful, but it's it's tough. Yeah, so. yeah. Um. So where is the EU getting their supply from now? So obviously, I'm going to answer that maybe for you. Kazakhstan. Yeah, Niger. Kazakhstan. Um, Niger is the second, well, is, was uh, the second uh, largest producer. They supplied 
up to last year, 25% of oh, European wow. needs. That was, yeah, it was up to half of France's need. So if you think that Niger is just not going to produce uranium and the French aren't going to go in there and do something about it, about it. I wouldn't bet on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and they're expanding their fleet now. So that's you know likely to go up. I, I wouldn't bet my money on that. Um, and then you also have Canada as you know the, the third place um, for that. And I, mm -hmm. I think maybe Namibia does a little bit, but not too much. But the, the three big ones would be Kazakhstan, then Niger, and also Canada. Mm -hmm. Do you ever see a, a market where you might get different pricing based on where your uranium is coming from? And yeah. are the buyers ever going to take a stance to be like, hey, we need this coming from good jurisdictions, safe jurisdictions, and people with an ESG lens? Too as well, right? Like you talked about the Kazakhstan production and the Niger production, they're not going to have the ESG standards that North American producers have. Absolutely. So that could be a factor. Um, the fact that the Kazakhs uh, are struggling so much to get material out of the country could be a factor as well. Um, and the Kazakhs also have a deal with China, uh, whereby they've set up this sort of warehouse um, on the border. And they want to have it as a trading house, right? Uh, you know, right as you cross from Kazakhstan into China. And it might be that, you know, they're unofficially setting up their own uranium market out there as well. So it's it's one thing from the Western's point of view to, to look at it and say, okay, I want to make sure that I'm going to get the pounds, right? First mm -hmm. place. And then also that they come from jurisdictions where, you know, my end user is not going to have a problem with it. But there's also the fact that, you know, in the East, um, maybe there won't be that concern as much and they'll still need material mm -hmm. and they need their own setup there that they can trade freely uh, or otherwise, uh, but not have it go through, you know, any sort of like Western facilities. So that's entirely possible. We could be looking at something similar to, you know, the oil market. There's Brent, mm -hmm. there's yep. UTI. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, how have you, you're quite young. Um, and Thank how have you, you seen... It's, it's a filter <laughs> on Zoom. <laughs> Perfect. Um, but like, how do you think the the young investors, like the, the, the next generation of investors are embracing this, this pro-nuclear movement? This is something that's quite new. Like I was born in 86. So it was the year of doom for, you know, nuclear. That's when mm -hmm. Chernobyl happened. And all my life, all I've heard regarding nuclear was really bad and scary. And I always thought that, you know, this is something too dangerous to mess with. I think what my generation, I guess our generation gets is that we can't imagine a world going forward that uses less electricity than what we do now. And we absolutely will not go back, you know, to our standard of living before what we know today. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also the fact that millennials in particular, we're caught in a really strange place of, okay, so there were the boomers before us, they could buy a house with, you know, 35K back in the day. And you could have, you know, just the men working for the household and the woman didn't have to go to work and just take care of the kids. We couldn't do that. Like we did not have that. We have the, we had the crash of uh, 08 happened and that nothing really helped us economically from, you know, the Western perspective. And we then saw the younger generation come and start investing in crypto. Yeah. And I think that a lot of us got really pissed because <laughs> we saw yes we saw you know young stupid people making a lot of money and old stupid people making a lot of money and just mm -hmm. sitting on you know like millions worth of real estate and we're like caught in the middle thinking interesting we need we need something that is high return like what is it and something and you I believe think, in yeah and it's something that you know I, I think goes along with our values the whole uh, fact that nuclear is clean energy. I think it fits right with what we want to leave as a legacy. So I think it has some, some of that speculation sprinkle on top of it. Mm, that's it. I, I really appreciate that perspective of you as a millennial, because I'm much older than you and there's a crowd uh, you much young, younger than like you. Me. And <laughs> I, 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 that was, that was a really uh, interesting perspective there. Um, so what do you think the, the biggest misconceptions about 
you're investing in uranium is, whether it's stocks or the metal or whatever. I think the biggest misconception doesn't just regard investing in uranium, but investing in, let's call it mining stocks or junior mining stocks, is that when we look at the supply and demand dynamics of any commodity, that only speaks of the commodity itself. It usually is expected to reflect on the supply and demand of the stocks. Stocks itself, yeah. But that's a different dynamic. That's a different story. And so, for instance, I fully believe and could literally bet money on the fact that the price of uranium is going to go up based on supply and demand, period. And then you have to ask yourself, okay, are the stocks going to go up? My belief is yes, and they must because... At some point, uh, producer producers are going to have to come online, or a new production is going to have to come online. And for that to happen, you know, there needs to be a financial incentive, and then that that's going to follow, you know, a, a bigger, not longer, but wilder, more speculative leg of the bull market. So, in, in this case, yes, I believe so, but it means that they don't move in tandem mm-hmm. because the price of the commodity is moving. But maybe the stock that you want to buy has more shares out than when you bought it last time. So there's more supply and maybe a lot of people have thrown in the towel so there's less demand. So for totally. you, the yep. supply and demand in balance isn't there because what you're buying is not the commodity itself. Unless yeah. you're buying the commodity. <clears throat> but you know, most people don't yeah. like to uh, buy barrels of uranium and try to put them in, no. in garages. No. You're buying the stock. <laughs> You're buying the stock. And so you have to ask yourself, okay, what, how does this, or how can this reflect the story that's happening with the commodity? Yeah. I think most people don't get that. Well, you, you nail on the head. When there's more demand than supply for uranium, uranium will go higher. When there's more demand for the uranium stocks than the sell side, then those stocks will go higher. And But we are in a disconnect right now across the mining sector, or it doesn't matter. And that will change. And, you know, in six months from now, we're probably going to have a, a different conversation going, oh, my God, look at these uranium stocks. They're ripping. But we just all go in cycles and it will happen. And uh, when it does, I'd, I'd love to have you back on the show to talk about Can all you? the stocks that you're going to rattle off right now that you <laughs> liked in the sector. We're going to check up on you in six months. <laughs> oh, man, I'm going to be super biased. So I'm on the board of a company called Rush Rare Metals and uh, haven't talked about them in a long time for various reasons, which shall become apparent as time goes on, obviously. And uh, I can't talk too much about it. But the reason why I'm excited is, yes, we do have an asset in the USA. I love the USA as a jurisdiction. I think that obviously it, it seems you know contradictory to what I answered uh, to your previous question. There is no good jurisdiction. However, I think there are jurisdictions that are just simply going to appreciate because the price will appreciate. And I like jurisdictions where we know the uranium is there already. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the U.S. is so packed full of uranium resources that most people don't really understand and appreciate. The yep. uranium is there. It's not going to be Athabasca Basin grade, but it's there. It's uh, much easier to get to. There are issues regarding red tape and it takes time, uh, but it's there. And so the fact that it's there it makes me really hopeful to you know companies that want to grab a quick up move in the uranium market. I think what's going to happen is that a lot of these American companies are going to be able to uh, be able to publish results and come up with resources that were historical mm-hmm. uh, because they know where to drill. They know they have something. Yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's not a matter of do you have something? It's how much of it do you have? And, you know, what's the grade? So I really like the U.S. as, as a jurisdiction. And um, what I would say is that, OK, people are going to kill me for saying this. Niger is a real wild card. Yeah. Don't count it out. Oh, God, no. No, I agree with you. They need need uranium to be produced and exported. The person who has taken over the um, minister of or ministry of mines in Niger is a former uranium guy. So... It would bode well for them to keep that part of their economy running as smoothly as possible. There was a rumor back in the day that, you know, 
they were going or that they had pronounced uh, an export ban. Um, it wasn't really what happened. What happened is that the neighboring countries are trying to put pressure on Niger and, you know, stopping certain uh, routes or facilities uh, from happening so that it would, you know, block their exports. And so there's this whole back and forth. We don't know who's going to be in power. It won't be the first time. It isn't the first time that there's been a coup in that part of the world. Probably yeah. won't be the last time this happens. Uh, but it goes back to, okay, the commodity is likely going to continue to be mined and exported. I believe in that. But how are investors going to perceive it? You know, Global Atomic, GovX, Mirrored Uranium, they've had a hard, hard, uh, hard month, I guess yes, you could say. Yeah, yeah. Right? Hard I, felt month. So, they... I felt so bad for the Global Atomic shareholders. I, I just, Absolutely. It's got a huge UTWIT following. It's got a, just it's a fantastic, a it's got great volume, got great liquidity. Yeah. And great assets. And, too. and it's just one of those black swan events. It's like, yeah. oh, and uh, they all seem to happen in a bear market when everyone's already hurting. Yeah. Which is so it's way. like, this is like people really throwing in the towel mm. and saying like, mm. to hell with this. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm not a, I wasn't a shareholder, a global atomic, but I'm watching it like a hawk right now. And if we can get some sort of direction on what's happening mm -hmm. there, I, I think you'd see that, that stock jump very quick. Yeah. So, so I am a shareholder. I haven't sold a single stock. Should I, I don't know. Uh, but I wouldn't count them out just yet. I mean, the mm -hmm. asset's still there. It's not going to go anywhere. I think it's more a, a matter of how quickly can they go back to, you know, their original plan of putting things into production. Mm -hmm. There are way too many questions right now. They won't be answered immediately, but I'd, I'd be watching them. It, it, maybe the people who really wanted to exit the, the company have already done so. I don't know that fully, uh, but a lot of them have. And so it's it's an interesting entry point. It could all go belly up and yeah. it could, in theory, get nationalized, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't buy it, but I'm watching it like a hawk. I'm really watching Global Atomic and Mary Uranium. I hold both. It, I, it's going to take some patience and some guts on that oh, one yeah. right now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But th there yeah. could be a, just a huge reward for for yeah. that, for the for people to find those guts of theirs. Yeah. Um, any yeah. new, any new high grade discoveries or kind of deposits, maybe in the basin that you think people have to follow, have to watch. So I would watch, um, F3 uranium. I'm biased mm -hmm. because they used to be a client of mine. Uh, they're no longer, but I still hold the stock. And the thing with their company is that the stock ran way too hard as they were making the discovery. As it always happens in the Athabasca yeah, Basin, yeah. you're making a high grade discovery, and it, it seems legit. You know the grades that are it coming does. out of it uh, with uh, they're getting continuity, um, slowly but surely, but they're getting it, and it seems like compared to previous major discoveries, they're they're faring better. You know than the first next gen hole, they're faring better than the first um, ISO energy and fission. Um, holes. And so it's something to watch, but then you have to go back to the market cap and say, okay, is this a good entry point? I think that a lot of the holes that have come out recently have not gotten the market too, too excited. And I think it has nothing to do with the holes. I think it has to do with the fact that valuation people were betting on it already. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Oh, 100%. So well, I, then, it, then it happened and it they kind of sold off. Didn't they hit like 200 million cap? or like 120 million cap just off like the first two holes. I was like, holy crap. Yeah, it was 140 to 50. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, they've it done a great job. Far. That that discovery certainly looks exciting. And uh, yeah, it's all sorts of exciting things going on in the basin right now. And that's certainly where you get your torque on discovery, right? 100%. Which is su super exciting. I think the US, like you said, probably a little less risk on the drill yeah. um, because you're often going after historic deposits. But I don't think you're going to get the torque after following up on those, because again, people think, are like, I expected yeah. that to be there. I don't right. think anybody's all of a sudden going to, you know, make a one plus percent uh, grade, you know, massive mm. intercept of uranium discovery in Wyoming. I love Wyoming. It's the best jurisdiction, but it's a different bet. You're making a bet that as the whole market moves up, 
the story is going to move up with it and those deposits are going to come closer and closer to being economic. And so it's it's more of like a slow grind or you know just a movement with the price of the commodity, uh, quote unquote, but it's not going to be due to the discovery of something new. At least I don't expect that. It's been mm. quite thoroughly drilled. So I, I wouldn't expect anything like that. Yeah. And you know, like don't don't count out the producers, you know, because Adam Prom and Cameco at the end of the day, they're they're moving in price and because Adam Prom pays a dividend, for goodness yeah. sake. Like money flow is going there right now, yeah, right? It's, yeah. it's it's a super important metric to follow in my in my opinion. Um is. Fabi, how do my listeners find out more about you? Uh, they can go on the next big rush.com and sign up for you know my free newsletters. They yep. get to hear what happened in mining today every single day. Uh, and you can you know you can unsubscribe, but unless you unsubscribe, you're you're gonna get to hear what happened in mining <laughs> today every single day. Uh, they can also follow me on Twitter and on YouTube. The name is the same, the next big rush. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put your profiles in, in our description there as well. Um, one thing I love about your letter is you kind of make me laugh every day. You, 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 bring, you, you bring in like a great sense of humor to the industry, which I think we could all use right now. Um, very few people not beat up right now in this game. So um, thank you so much for taking the time today. That was a super interesting conversation. And um, until next week and uh, or until we chat again, uh, thanks very much for tuning into our show. Thank you, Arlen. Take care. Thank you.